Hello, everybody. How are you guys doing? Pretty good. Can everybody hear me okay? No. No? A little closer? Is that better? Okay. I'm John Shikadans. I'm the executive director at the Ingler. Um, we're really honored to be able to come and speak to you guys for a little bit about what's going on at the theater because um, it's been a year of a lot of change, obviously. So I'm sure everybody's curious about what's going on down there. So you can keep going. So before we get... What's that? Louder? Can you hear me now? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So before we uh, get too far into everything, I wanted to actually give an introduction to our senior team. Um, many of you probably know that Andre Perry, the previous executive director, left about a year ago. And at that time, I was placed in the interim position. And since then, we've had a lot of change in our senior team. Um, all of it has been really good, um, but we have a lot of new faces that I wanted to introduce. So I'm obviously the first one up there. Uh, Sarah Sean Rock, our operations director, has actually been there 11 years. So she is the longest tenured employee at this point. Um, pretty cool. She, she knows everything about the building, so if there's anything that we're always like, what is going on here, she's the one to go to. And she gives amazing tours if you're ever able to, to get over there. Brian Johannesson is our uh, senior programming manager. He worked with the Inkler for quite a while before he was hired into this position um, on things like Mission Creek. And he also has a um, series that he produced outside of the Inkler called Dead Coast Presents. Um, and he actually got his start um, kind of as a protege to Andre. And so he had a lot of experience at the Inkler. And when Andre was the executive director, he actually held that position and the lead programming role. And so when he left, we split that into two and invited uh, Brian to join the team. I'll let you introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Keegan Coletta Huckfelt. I am new to the England. I'm the senior production manager. I started back in April of 2022, so we're, we're getting there. Mission Creek of 2022, the first one back and from the beginning of the pandemic, was my first week on the job, so I was getting baptized by fire. Uh, to jump in with all those events. Uh, so new to the Englert, but Iowa and the arts are new to me. I spent eight years working at the old Creamery Theater in the Amanda Colonies. Um, started as an intern with that company and worked all my way up to being the interim artistic director uh, prior to the pandemic happening. Then I moved out with my wife to Washington, D.C. for a year. And then this job came available, and Iowa wasn't home. I grew up in Missouri, went to school in Illinois, but the Midwest is home. And while the arts deserve to exist everywhere, I think it's really important that we make sure the arts exist everywhere, not just in the major metropolitan hubs. Um, I firmly believe that's important. And so my favorite things about working for the Creamery were giving people work, creating work for artists, and making sure that the arts existed in these communities. And that's what I get to do at the, uh, at the England, excuse me, too many words, uh, every day. So it's pretty exciting. So yeah, I'm excited to be here and get to talk to you all today. Thanks, Keegan. Uh, there's two more people at the bottom, but I'm realizing I didn't give you much background about myself. So before I was the interim director, I actually worked at the Inkler as the marketing director. Um, that was an amazing role. I learned so much and worked really closely with Andre to make sure that people knew about all of the events that were happening. Um, and before that, I actually worked at Midwest One for uh, since 2008, so it was about 10 years, and that was an amazing experience, learned a lot, um, and it really prepared me for a leadership role at the Ingler, so I'm, I'm thankful. <laughs> um, there's two names here at the bottom, and you guys are getting a little bit of a sneak peek because these people haven't even been announced to the public yet. We just hired both of them, so <laughs> you're getting an insider's view here. Uh, Ella Kang was actually in our marketing department, but was just promoted today as the lead marketer. So she will take over the role for uh, developing the strategy behind our brand, how we talk to patrons and donors, and make sure that everybody's informed about what we're doing at the theater. And then Taylor Jackson is coming in as our senior development manager. I'm not sure how many of you had the opportunity to meet Katie Roche when she was at the Inkler. 
she she recently left um, to go over to the library. Love Katie, she's great. We still have a lot of connection with her, but it opened up our development uh, position and Taylor's gonna be coming in. She is currently getting, uh, she's in the graduate program, getting a degree in stage management. So she has a lot of background in theater, um, but she also works for a nonprofit out of Omaha uh, that uh, she works in their development department um, getting grants for art that's coming to that area. So we're excited to welcome her to the area. It's my turn. <laughs> so in addition, one of my major jobs as the production manager is running the production department. I also manage the facilities, which means I get to care about the history of this amazing building and what it's meant to the community. And being the last historic theater is pretty important. So several of you probably know the history. For those of you that don't, I'm going to talk about it. And if I get something wrong or you know something that I don't know, please tell me because I would like to know more. So it opened up on September 26, 1912 by William and Etta Englert. It replaced a livery stable and it housed a barber shop and a candy shop. I think that fact is pretty cool. The candy shop is where the box office is right now. The barber shop is where the elevator was. And so you can still see the floor. If you, if you haven't seen it, look outside the front of the building. You can see the barbershop floor sticking out there, which is pretty miraculous that it's still there. Um, it initially had uh, 1,071 seats. I like to point that out when I'm doing tours within the building because it shows you just how tiny those chairs were to fit over 1,000 seats in the building. We now house 730. So we, we've trimmed it back just a little bit in there. Um, William and Etta resided on the second floor. That's where our lounge is. And if you haven't been there since the most recent renovation, I highly encourage you to come check it out. It's much larger. So you can actually see all of their various rooms. Uh, you can see where William died in the back corner of the building. He's sitting right over there. So, And then it provided housing for the traveling artists on the third floor, which has gone through so many renovations. It became apartments for a long time. Anybody in this room live in the England? I ask that because it feels like every time I have somebody coming in to propose to do work at the Englert, they go, oh, I lived here. Can I show you where my bedroom was? And so I go open up the closet and I go, I put a twin bed in here. I hung my clothes above the bed. It's pretty miraculous. Um, but so that's now where our administrative offices are. So it's just a pretty cool place to get to see the history. I said almost all the pictures are new. This one is clearly very new. I just took it yesterday. Um, but I think it's pretty cool. I, if my history is correct, which I'm pretty sure, I double checked, this is the second of the marquees that hung on the building. So this, the first one was, was closer to the bottom edge, this one stuck out. But it's just a pretty miraculous thing to get to see it and to see the ornate design that still holds true for the building itself. Then, of course, the building caught on fire in 1926. Has everybody heard the story of what happened? No? Okay. So, in the 1920s, it started to show more and more films. And in the back booth, the film booth still exists back there, it's now a fireproof, fireproof room because the film caught on fire. And the projectionist at the time went, eek, oh no, the building's on fire, and left. And instead of going across the street to the telegraph office, went to the local watering hole to calm his nerves. And then came back to the telegraph office and said, hey, the building's on fire. And they pointed across the street and said, yes, we know. We can see the flames coming out. We already called people. By the time they got there, they were able to save the outside of the building, but the inside of the building was torched. Um, and so it took, what's the number? Let me pack here. That's a picture of the fire itself getting put out, right? It's amazing that exists. John found this picture. It's just miraculous. There were no people in the building. Basically. Yeah. So what took sixty thousand dollars to build initially in 1912 cost 125 thousand dollars to rebuild in 1926. So it's miraculous and amazing that they were able to accomplish it in less than a year to be able to get the building back up and presenting art, which it continued to do and do and do. So that leads us to today, right? We have this beautiful marquee that sits out front. This is marquee number four or five, yeah. Um, it's just pretty miraculous that it's presented art pretty continuously through, from opening in 1912, 
fire in 1926 continued to produce and or not produce but show movies all the way until 1999 when it shut down was bought by a concerned group of citizens or saved by a concerned group of citizens which is my favorite phrase about it because normally you hear that phrase and you go oh yeah that's the cliche but no it's true a group of concerned citizens gathered and saved the last historic theater and turned it into the nonprofit that gets to present so much art for the community every day. So, thanks for listening to me talk about the history. John's going to talk a little bit about where we are. I'll also say before you switch that photo, um, some of you may remember two years ago that marquee was removed from the building completely and redone. Um, we, as part of our Strength and Grow Evolve campaign, um, we're fortunate enough to work with the city to get some funding to uh, completely repair the marquee, which wasn't in working condition. When you would turn it on, there was a loud hum inside the building, which is never a good sign. So now we are very happy to have it back on the building. And um, if you're ever down there when there's a show going on, it's just gorgeous to see the lights lit up. Wrong way. <laughs> Okay, so I've talked a little bit about all of the changes that are going on at the Inglert. We obviously have a lot of people that have changed. I also talked a little bit about the campaign. So in uh, 2018, it actually started a little bit before that, but the, the beginning rumblings started in uh, uh, 2018. We started the, the Strength and Grow Evolve to uh, improve the building solidify our programming um, and, and really uh, make some needed improvements to our operations. Um, that was in collaboration with Film Scene and so that went on for many years. We're still in kind of a collection phase with that, but the outward um, fundraising for that effort is done. So for the time period that the campaign was going on, our strategic plan revolved around the campaign. So as Andre exited the organization and the campaign wrapped up, we very much were in a place where we needed to decide who are we today at the end of this campaign, where do we want to be, and how do we create goals to, to meet our needs. And so we went through a pretty uh, uh, rigorous strategic planning process to, to really evaluate everything that was going on in the operation and identify who we were. Um, through that process, we reevaluated both our mission and vision. I'm happy to say that the mission went through many iterations and came back to its original, uh, original format. So that mission is to inspire and activate positive community growth through the arts. And we really feel like through the strategic planning process, we were able to uh, reiterate that that's the goal that we're trying to meet here. We also uh, created the vision to build and sustain a thriving art-centered community. We believe that this moment in time is really a nexus for how we move forward. There is so much collaboration in the arts community happening right now. We're very fortunate to be in a community where the arts organizations want to work together and we are all working for a mutual benefit here. And we are very much in a place where, where that is accelerating, um, especially as we exit the campaign and with Riverside coming downtown. It's really an amazing moment in downtown Iowa City. So I'm not gonna uh, read these for you, but these are actually the values that we established through the strategic planning process, really trying to make sure that we remain connected to the community, that we're not you know, a singular entity, we're not an island here. We need to make sure that there's connection happening with our organization. Um, we recommitted to promoting diversity, both in artistry, uh, the artists that are in our building, and also uh, the patrons. So we're doing a lot of work right now to make sure that we are um, a space for everybody in the community. Openness, we want to make sure that we are uh, you know, open to new ideas, that we're not shut off thinking that we know every answer, because we don't. We, we are very much looking for feedback from the community at all times and working with our community partners to better ourselves. And then stewardship really relates to the building itself. We feel so honored to be able to 
um, be in this historic space that has been saved by the community in, in large part. And um, we have a duty to make sure that it remains there for the next generation. And so we take that responsibility really seriously. So I talked a little bit about kind of our foundational documents. That's uh, all well and good, but this is the actual kind of strategy that we're looking at as we move towards the future. So we have four strategic goals that we're focused on. Each year there will be new goals to help us uh, that, that kind of go up to these larger goals. Um, but these are the main things that we're focused on. So reestablishing our programmatic vision. One thing that we realized is as Andre left the organization, he had created an amazing uh, programmatic legacy that was developed around his relationships and his vision for what the Angler should be. That's amazing, but we don't have the same relationships that he had, and we are identifying gaps in the community today um, that need to be filled. And so we recognize that the goals of the past may not be the goals of today or for the future. And so we are very much taking this duty seriously. We have two programmers now that are working to um, bring shows to the theater, even more shows than we had in the past. Um, we've increased our utilization rate pretty dramatically. So you may have seen that there's a lot more shows going on at the Inkler not only at the Inkler, but at off-site spaces as well. We are really trying to program throughout the community. And this programmatic vision will drive that to determine what are the gaps in the community, what can we do really well, and how can we fill those gaps. The second one is achieve long-term sustainability. As a nonprofit, we face a lot of challenges in this area. Um, especially coming out of the pandemic. We were closed for 18 months. Um, and so the financial aspect of sustainability is really challenging right now. We're seeing costs increase pretty dramatically. Um, patrons are down about 30% on average per show. Um, and at the same time, we've increased the number of shows. So we're seeing bigger gaps in, in the financial barriers that we're, we're facing. And so we're, we're trying to think really creatively about how we can meet those needs, both through patronage and also donors, new revenue streams, cost-saving measures. We're really looking at this holistically to determine how we can move forward in the best way. The third one is care for the community. What I like to say about this is this is the most broad goal that we have because we identify community as our employees, uh, artists that are coming to the space, our patrons, and the community at large. So it's really wide ranging in terms of what we're trying to do here. But some tactical things that go into this are um, pay equity, making sure that we are compensating artists what they deserve when they come in the building, and also making sure that we're supporting the local arts economy. So there are a lot of artists in our area making sure that they have an opportunity to perform here in their hometown um, and, and bring them up through the ranks and, and really support them in that effort. And then the last one is participate in Nexus Building. I talked about that a little bit before. We have, since we were kind of refounded in 2004, grown pretty substantially. Um, we've been very lucky that, uh, you know, patrons keep coming and donors keep supporting us and, and because of that we've grown we are determined to recognize our status in the community and make sure that we're bringing the next round of arts uh, leaders up so it's not just us we need to keep pulling people up because that's what makes this community vibrant we've talked about quite a bit of the programmatic vision, so I won't dive back into everything. The first point I'll point out, our Englert Presents and its offshoots, I think is a really important thing. Sometimes on a show you'll see it says Englert Presents, or Englert Presents, sometimes it says Mission Creek. That's meant to just help us identify what type of programming is happening, but it really gets back to the stuff that uh, Brian says it best, my partner Brian. He says, I bring people in and they're the people we're gonna pay to come perform here. 
I, on the other hand, am responsible for finding people that want to pay us to use the building. So Brian deals with that first one, the Ingler presents and its offshoots for its mass part. He also oversees our literary programming, which I think is such an important thing for the city of literature to have pre presented at the historic theater in Iowa City, right? So it's something that I really love about our programming. The next one is our rental and community engagement, which I'm gonna talk just a little bit about because I think it's really, really important. One of the things that came out of the Strength and Grow Evolve campaign was a closer relationship with both Riverside Theater and the film scene and how our three organizations can work better together to make sure that our arts community is well represented and thriving as we move into the next decade and the decade after that, right? So with that comes a unique opportunity as we're trying to increase our utilization of the space to go, well, we can't always afford to just bring more and more people in, or we'd like to try, and we are trying, but sometimes that doesn't make sense. What does make sense is making sure that our community organizations that want to have a space to present their art have that place to be there. So the Iowa City Community String Orchestra is one of those organizations. The list can go on and on. Do you guys have a guess the percentage of shows that we present versus community are? It's 40% community organizations that use our space, which I think is pretty miraculous for an arts organization to exist and to have grown so much and still be able to support that much of the community outside of their own work. And I think it only works because we consider it our work. It doesn't matter if we're the ones paying the bills for it or not, we want there to be good art for everybody to come see so that somebody can come see their grandchild perform in a dance show Somebody can come see the string orchestra, or somebody can come see, what's a big con what's a big show coming up? Spoon was just here, because they want to come see Spoon, or they want to come see Mission Creek. They can get all of those experiences right in downtown Iowa City. So that's why it's so important that it's part of our programmatic vision. The last part is our education, which is something that's existed on and off, but not had a necessary uh, magnifying glass put to it about what it can mean to the community and is something that we have really focused on with our new strategic plan of how can we make sure we're serving the education needs of Iowa City and the surrounding communities. What that doesn't mean though is that we're just going to create some classes for students. That's important. It's very important. It also exists around the community right now. So we're trying to look strategically to go, well, what else could exist? Could we do a whole new lecture series about what's going on? Can we find a way to build a bridge to some college students who are interested in becoming arts administrators, but don't have a way to bridge from getting their degree to actually moving into that field? So those are the things that we're looking to roll out in the next six to 18 months as we're moving forward. So I already talked about the first part, the 40% community programming, which I am so uh, happy about. Something else that Brian likes to say that I said to him, I was gonna share tonight, is that one of our jobs is to create a respite for audiences, right? You have, everybody has a work, an outside life that they're living, whether it's going to work, dealing with family, financial, health, there's so many things going on to the world. And when you step inside a theater, yes, you wanna be challenged and you wanna think, but you also wanna be able to escape from things that are happening in the rest of the world. And so that's one of our major responsibilities. Um, we want to make space for everybody within our building, and for those that don't feel welcome in our building, we want to know why that is and find a way to make everybody feel welcome. And it's a really big job, and it's a job that never stops, but it's a big, important growth for us. Um, community traditions. I can speak to a lot of different ones, but I think the Nutcracker may sum it up the best of this community gathering space from multiple organizations coming together to build this thing. That's really important. And then finally, engaging and challenging our audiences. And I like to think that we're carrying on Andre's work that he started and really pushed forward each and every day. At least we're trying and striving to. Uh, okay, so we've talked a lot about kind of what we hope to do in the future, what I, what's our strategy here, um, but we haven't talked kind of nuts and bolts about what that means you'll see in terms of difference at the theater, right? So I wanted to talk a little bit about some things that were added in 2022. Um, we, we introduced a local showcase series 
Um, this is very much in the effort to support local artists and make sure that their art is seen by diverse audiences. A lot of times when artists are emerging, they can get into this bubble where the people that know about them know about them, and then it's hard to, to increase awareness. And so we hope that by having a local showcase series, we're able to broaden their audience and bring new people into the fold. Um, Mission Creek Festival, this is not new, but this will be the first year that it's back in the way that it is this year. I don't know if you guys have heard, but we're partnering for the first time in many years with Hancher to open the festival at their facility. Um, we'll actually be bringing an artist named Cat Power um, to the theater, and we think it's going to be a really big event. The reason that that's important for us is our facility isn't big enough to house the number of people that we think will be at that. Uh, event. So our partnership with Hancher enables us to bring more people in while still producing the art that, that we want to create. And, and Mission Creek is a really diverse um, group of acts that we bring together every April. And so we're really excited to partner with Hancher again this year. It, it's really um, kind of a momentous thing for us. Um, this year was the first year that we um, had Truthsgiving. Truthsgiving is actually an event that was created by the Great Plains Action Society. Um, they are Native Americans who tell the story of their side of the story about what Thanksgiving means to them. And they bring indigenous artists to the stage to really celebrate that moment. And so we were really happy to be able to partner with them and, and celebrate their side of that story in a different way. Um, I already talked a little bit about our utilization rate. As of right now, we have a show about every three days. That's up from um, about every four or five days. And so it's a pretty big increase. We anticipate that that increase will continue. We want there to be a sense that when you come downtown, it doesn't matter when you're down there, something is happening, whether it's at the Inkler, or film scene or Riverside. There's always something happening that you can just pop in and, and enjoy. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, if, if any of you have been in recently, you may have noticed some uh, changes to the building itself. Um, we did a lot of work during the capital campaign. We talked about the marquee quite a bit. Um, much of the work that was done as a result of the campaign was things that you won't see as a patron. The back wall was replaced because it was a safety hazard. We replaced HVAC. These are very necessary things, but things that, that you may not see when you come in. We are now focusing on some things that you will see. So we're looking at things like the carpet, the paint, how is the facility maintained in a way that feels very comfortable when you come in. Eventually, we're looking at things like seating, uh, you know, all of the things that make it an experience that you want to enjoy in our space. And so we're taking stock of what we have now and making a plan for improvements in the future. And then I'm sure you guys have heard about this. We really shouted it from the rooftops. Uh, we just a couple of weeks ago had a brand new sound system installed in our building. This is the first time that the facility has ever had a brand new sound system. The sound system that was installed in 2004 when we were reestablished was uh, second hand and donated. And so over the years, it really began to show its age. And we're so happy that patrons stuck with us. We started to hear some comments, you know, Ooh, the sound isn't as great as I was hoping. We heard that and took that seriously. And we actually spent around $400,000 to replace that system. It's a major investment for us. Um, what I can tell you is you will notice a difference when you're in the space. It is incredible the difference that, that the new system has made. So we're really excited about that. <laughs> I'm gonna steal it back for just a second. One of the things John didn't talk about when he was talking about the campaign and all the work that you don't see is making sure that the building stands up and is there for the next, we talked about it, generation and generation to come. There is a steel beam that goes from the very bottom of the building now to the very top that didn't used to exist there about two years ago that cost a quarter of a million dollars. But that quarter of a million dollar beam means that we get to make sure that building is there. It means that people get to walk into the space and get to visit it every time because they know it's safe to be there. It means we get to continue operating. 
I've gotten to run a theater for a very long time, even though it hasn't been the Englert. The Englert's my first historic theater. And man, sometimes you look at the price tag and all the repairs that have to happen and you go, oh my gosh, could that be worse? And the answer is yes, and you don't say that and you knock on wood and you say, thank you, I'm glad it's not worse. But it also gives us a great responsibility, right? Because we know that the art that gets presented and what it means to the community is so valuable that every step that we take makes it a little bit easier for the next person to come and the next person to come. And in the end, that's our goal. It's one of the things, I'm gonna pop back here to a picture about this wall. This is the wall in the lounge once it got updated with our most recent capital campaign, Thank You Wall. And it's such a cool space to see, number one, because it's beautiful. And I talked about the lounge earlier and said it's a lot bigger. That's true. The windows got retrofitted so that there's no longer icy air coming through them, causing ice to freeze up on people's offices down there, which is also a big win. But also, you walk into the space and you see the beautiful light coming in in downtown Iowa City, and you go, yeah, this is it. This is why we care about these beautiful old buildings and what they mean to us and why we wanna make sure there's showcases and show pieces for our community to get to represent itself. I can't tell you the number of artists that walk in when we talk about the production, of the artists coming in to work with the production staff, that comment about how pretty it is and how much they get, like getting to work there. I watched the new sound system go in right before Christmas and get worked on last week. It's gonna have its first event on Friday and its first actual show on Saturday and the sound is truly phenomenal. It is so clear, I, it, it is a truly masterful difference. Um, There's so many more extra speakers to create pockets of sound around the room so that you're not having to listen to just one main speaker source. So I hope you guys come out and I get to say hi to you there and get to point out the difference because I promise you'll see it. Uh, before you switch the photo to, I just wanna say I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that some of the people in this room are actually on that wall as major supporters of the campaign. And so um, I just wanted to take a moment to actually you know, thank the contributions that made the most recent uh, work at the theater happen. It, it wouldn't have happened without that support, so it means a lot. So that's all we had for the presentation itself, but we'd love to answer questions if anybody has some. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. One of the things that um, really hammered that home for us was the pandemic. Um, you know, there have been so many new media sources that have come out, podcasts, TV, film. You would think that that would take away from the, the work that we do at the theater. Um, but what we found is during the pandemic, it really, um, kind of doubled down on the fact that people need that community and they need to be together in a space enjoying art together. Um, it's different than enjoying that, um, you know, at your home. Uh, it, it's just a different thing. And so I, I hear what you're saying. We hear that a lot about the reduction in theaters and how um, it was a huge change for the community as a whole. So we feel very lucky that we, that the building remains and that our organization remains. Um, I'm somebody who's worked a lot with Riverside. Yeah. I was one of the honorary co-chairs for the capital campaign. And I wondered if you'd like to say something about, uh, specifically about what you foresee in terms of working directly now that Riverside is in the area. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'll say again that in many communities, the thought of a, a theater coming downtown and um, into the space that we already occupy would be very scary. We welcomed it with open arms. It is an asset to our community. We've already started working uh, pretty collaboratively with Riverside, even more than we were in the past. 
things like our mission creek festival went to goes out into the community we housed several of our events at riverside theater and we actually housed the first musical events ever in that space we anticipate that that will continue and it will be reciprocal there will be things where riverside will have events that will be able to support in our space as well the same thing is happening with film scene now oftentimes they will have an event where they're bringing in um, maybe a director or a screenwriter and they know it's a big event and they need more space with the uh, improvements that we made to the sound system we also purchased a new forty thousand dollar projector so that we could work more collaboratively with organizations like film scene um, and riverside we the the dream there is that we will get to a place where we can come together uh, and, and schedule together. So we may be able to sit around a table and say, what's a topic that really needs to be covered in art in this community? And when is the time that we can come together in that sense? So maybe it's something like, um, I don't even wanna throw something out, but, but a topic that is very pertinent to the community. Riverside may be uh, uh, programming uh, plays around that. We, we may be having music that supports that and, and film scene might be doing films around that. That's the dream so that we create this festival uh, environment but it's owned by the individual organizations and we're all supporting this collaborative effort to, to make sure that the community is, is brought in on this conversation. Say anything about that? I mean, Adam's a good friend, and so we've we've had quite a few meetings to go. Well, what is what can this be? We also don't want to put a square pig in a round hole. We don't think that serves the community. So, as far as the idea, we are just actively going. Okay, we don't have it yet. Let's keep talking about what could this be to make this next thing happen. But I mean, I think I'd be remiss of saying this community is special. There's a reason I came back from D.C., which has so much art. There's so many things about it. But they very, it's a very possess, possessive world. In most theater communities, when you get there, it's my theater here and my theater there. It is a pretty special place to be in Iowa City to go, I can go to Coralville Center for the Performing Arts and direct Elf there and still have a job on the administration of a completely different theater. I stage managed at Riverside. To get to have that artistic community and artistic world is really special. So we see ourselves, that nexus word, I think, is what really points it out. We see ourselves as a, a driver of making sure that continues to exist. I have one more comment about that. We talked about programming quite a bit. One thing that we don't talk about publicly very often is um, coming out of the campaign, we actually spearheaded a memorandum of collaboration with both Riverside and Film Scene so that we outlined what we think that collaboration looks like and it, it brings it uh, front of mind. I actually just got off a call today with Andrew, the ED of Film Scene, and Adam, um, the Artistic Director at Riverside, and one of the things that we see in terms of that collaboration doesn't have anything to do with programming. It's actually about how the operation itself is run. Our small nonprofits are often challenged to provide the training and resources for our employees that we need to. And so we're looking at ways that we can cost share those efforts and come together to really meet the needs of our employees, um, make sure that they are getting training and resources in a way that we couldn't do on our own. So I'm really excited to see those things come to fruition. Yeah, you guys are really getting an inside view of what goes on here. So um, I talked about Brian being the lead programmer. Um, we have begun conversations to talk about that process exactly. He had, because he's the only one, oftentimes we are relying on people to, to communicate with us, but we just added people to that team so that we can be more intentional about the art that we're going after. Right now, it's probably 
in terms of 60% of the acts that we get are people that come to us and say that they want to be in our space. That's not to say that everybody that reaches out to us, we bring in. You know, we, we there's a curation process that goes with that. Um, but a lot of that is us receiving requests. We're hoping to turn that around and be more intentional in that arc. Um, so that's really exciting. One of the things that I talked about before, or that Keegan mentioned, was um, Ingler Presents and its offshoots. We recognize that there are programs at the Ingler now that may not be the programs that the current community needs. And so we are very much in the process of redefining what those programs are. Ingler Presents itself is not going to change. That's our core. You will continue to see that art come. But what are the other things that we can add in there? So we understand that there's a huge student body that's not particularly being served by the off-campus arts community. Um, we, we hope to, to be a better partner in that. Um, there are um, a lot of different uh, um, communities here inside our city that, that don't necessarily feel at home downtown or at the Ingler, and we're working hard to bring art that, that pulls them in or meets them in their space so that they're also being served. <laughs> You're the history person. What was the first production shown back in 1912? Ooh, you don't, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think it's, uh, I didn't talk about this earlier, but you got me on it, so here we go. Uh, down at the front of the stage, there is a pit at the Ingler that we have covered up, but it's a set of three steps down, and when you get in there, it's not enough space to put a modern day piano. You can't fit an upright in there, so I think that's pretty fascinating when you talk about what it was initially built to do. The fact that you could fit maybe two musicians on one side, and an older, an older small piano on the other side, and that's about the max you could fit in that space. So they think about a more vaudeville style, or then initial movies that would have an actual live accompanist playing with them. Yeah. Other questions? Other questions? Unfortunately, no. But what I can do is I will um, actually reach back out to Oak Knoll to make sure that we get that over to you. Great question. Sorry, we missed on that one. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions we can answer about the theater or where we're going? This is not a question, but it's a, a comment.
kind of you to say, it is very true. I, I live by a mantra that rising water floats all boats, and I think that's how we operate as, not only as an arts community, but as a community, right? We're all better when all of us can work together to succeed. So thank you for saying that, thank you for your very clear contributions to that. Everyone in this room, truly. John's right about the, that placard. It represents all the people that gave, and even if your name's not up there, that doesn't mean you didn't give in spirit, or in time, or in coming to see a show, or in sitting here and listening, um, which helps it live on. So, thank you. I, 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 I really appreciate that comment. That means a lot. Well, it, it, is, it is money, but it's the time that you guys are going to put in the way to say, between now and, you know, whatever great the next thing is that happens in the end of the And so thank you guys for committing to this and for, for taking it on because some of us are really tired. <laughs> Well, I mean, you mentioned that you were one of the concerned citizens that made this thing happen. Uh, it very much, we exist because of this community. We would not be here if it wasn't for the support of the community, period. And we are stewards of, of the business and, and the art that we produce, but we exist because of all of you guys. It, we're very lucky to be in a community that has the support that we do. Um, if we didn't have the support and the collaboration in the arts community, this would be a very different place. And just to give you uh, a, a quick story, I'm from Southeast Iowa, and, and we, did, we do not have an arts community that um, is anything like this. And growing up, we would travel more than 100 miles to come here because this was the place that was special. And I, at, being at the Inglert now is like, mind-blowing to me because I remember coming to this space and, and realizing how special it was, so. Thank you. 